questa sera siamo qua con un maestro del mentalismo, Luke Germain. So, thank you for coming, Luke. You're so welcome. Eh, ha fatto una bellissima lecture poco fa. You did a great lecture. Thank you. A moment. It looks pretty good from my side, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, I think uh, it's a very usable material. I hope so, yeah. And uh, very strong effect. Thank you. So, uh, you start very young in magic. Uh, very, very Can young. you tell us something about uh, how yes, you started? Yes, so my, um, my sort of journey in magic is uh, kind of atypical in the sense that I grew up in a household, uh, just my mom. But my mom was very drawn to things like tarot cards or palm reading or spiritualism. And then when I was, I don't know, maybe seven, I got my first magic trick, like a children's magic set. And I loved it. And because my mother was like drawn to mysterious things, she loved these things that I was learning how to do because she would teach me the tricks. She would read them from the books and teach me how to do the tricks. But she really loved it. So she was incredibly supportive of me doing magic from a very young age. But then as I became a teenager, I was drawn to mentalism because of her interest in things like tarot cards and so on. So I naturally sort of went in that direction because it was part of my, my life already. Um, and then uh, I never really stopped. So I started very young and my, my sort of pivotal moment was, uh, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I certainly wasn't yet a teenager. So I was still very young um, and I had been i had been to a, a place in London called Covent Garden, which is like a, a big yeah. square with some street performers in it. And there's also a magic, kind of, it was called the Magic Wagon, like a, a thing that sold magic tricks. And I had been bought a set of linking rings, and I was sitting in a park doing the linking rings, very, very badly. Uh, and a man came over to me and took them from me, and I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? You, you can't know the secret. And I was just a kid, right? And then he did the linking rings beautifully for me. Uh, and that man's name was Ken Hoskins. He's a local magician where I grew up. And he said, you have to meet this man called Ron McMillan. And then he brought Ron McMillan over. And, and then I met Ron McMillan. So uh, Ron McMillan, who used to own International Magic, sadly he's passed away, he's not with us anymore. But he was kind of my first teacher in magic. So as a, a young boy, maybe 12, uh, Ron kind of took me under his wing. And, um, and every weekend on Saturdays, i would travel to, from where I lived, just outside of London, into London with Ron and work in International Magic. And the Macmillan family, Ron Macmillan, Teresa Macmillan, Martin Macmillan, Georgina, sort of became a, a, a family to, to me. They really took in this little boy and they taught him magic tricks. And Martin and Ron would say, whatever is in the shop, take it with you, read it, bring it back when you're finished. Whatever lecture video, take it, it's yours. And, And, and then Ron introduced me to lots of great magicians and it was at that point that I kind of knew that that's what I'd always do. So it was, it was incredibly good luck yeah. to have met, not only met a really great magician, but met a really great magician that was so generous. Generous with his time, with his insight, uh, and to, to have such a fantastic family. Like, the International Magic family, all of them, Martin and Georgina and Teresa and Ron um, and Paul and others that are part of the family, uh, were just so welcoming. And now when I see them, it's like seeing my family, you know, yeah. like it really is. And they're really lovely yes. people. And, and they, I'm certain that without them, I would not be doing magic. I, I'm certain it would, just wouldn't have happened for me. I grew up in not a really, not like poverty, like it's not, some sort of weird rapper backstory where I grew up in the ghetto, but it is, I grew up in a, in a kind of... Yes. Suburb. Yeah, well, a suburb, but also like a, a single parent family. Oh, okay. um, uh, almost no money. Like enough money to be happy as a child. I, I didn't know that we didn't have any money. I wasn't like frightened or anything, but we didn't have a lot, you know, like um, yeah. we made toys. Like it was that kind of family. And when you look at learning magic, It's the kind of thing that could never have happened for somebody from my family background, financial family background, had it not been through the generosity of the Macmillans. It just, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have, there's no way my family could have found 
you know, 50 euros or 60 euros for a book on magic tricks. It just couldn't yeah. happen. So it, it, there's a very real chance that in an alternative universe, there is a little boy who was sitting in the park doing the linking rings, but on that day, Ron McMillan was somewhere else and didn't meet that little boy, and then he didn't go on to do magic just because he couldn't. So really, it's, uh, you know, entirely, to me, entirely down to the McMillans. Yeah. So that's how I sort of started magic, yeah. And um, now you have a new show. Yeah. And um, what's about that? So my last show uh, is coming to an end now. I toured it in the UK for something like five years, like a long time. Um, and it's been really well received and really great and I enjoyed it. It was It's a mentalism show. Uh, the first half is all demonstrations of direct telepathy, and then the second half is the questions and answers act. Okay. Um, it's two hours, it's been in theatres, uh, two hours with an interval. Um, it's been in theatres, the sort of the smallest room that I'll do could be, could be 200 people, but then over the course of a tour we'll do a show for 200 people, and then the next night for 3,000 people, and the next night for 200 people. You know, it's like yes. big rooms, little rooms, big rooms, little rooms. Um, so that one, I have one last show, which is in London, at a place called Wilton's Music Hall, which is this great old venue, really beautiful venue. And then that tour is officially finished, because it's been done several hundred times now, and I'm ready to do a new show. So I'm sort of sad to say goodbye to it, yeah. but also excited to do a new show. So I'll be touring a new show in England in 2019. Okay. Uh, you can I think, have a sneak peek about that. Yeah, it's not finished yet actually. Oh, okay, okay. It's not finished yet, but it's it's kind of there. And then also I'm about to start a, a show in Manchester in England, which will be a weekly show that I will do. So when I'm not touring, I'll be doing a show in Manchester as a kind of residency. And then for a few months of the year, we'll tour and do a different show on tour. So that'll be, I think, Probably March of 2019 it will tour. I've got ideas, but it's not finished yet. Yeah. Do you test your routine in Manchester during the, the show? No, the show, the show in Manchester will be a different show, a completely different show. That show's finished, okay. <laughs> because that show starts in three weeks or something. Okay. And that show is, is something really interesting because it's in a, in a kind of lounge theatre, not a traditional theatre. So it's not like curtains and then there's an audience. It's, people sat around and it has live music and, and doing like short sets of material and then taking a break and going and sitting with them and talking and having a drink and then there's food that comes out and then music plays and then I go back up on the stage and do so. So it's almost like a jazz club brought to life through mentalism. So it's a very weird kind of format for a show but it's really exciting and it's small, it only seats 50 people. So it's, it's like a, a kind of the only way I can describe it is like a jazz club, like you, that, that's the feel of it, being in a jazz club but with mind reading instead of jazz. And then obviously the touring show is a traditional theatre show, curtains open, we do the show, curtains close. But, so they're, they're two different things but it's exciting to do two very different things, you know. Uh, talking about uh, your performance, when I see you I can see you give something to the audience, it's yeah. not just uh, look at me, I'm No, I, I, the, I hope so. Uh, I hope so. And um, what's your point of view about uh, this, uh, this approach? I, well, think I think it's the... Yeah, I think mentalism is, is one of the strongest ways that you can uh, bring mystery to life for a modern audience. But unfortunately mentalism is, probably more than anything else, suffers from this problem of the performer yeah. being kind of God. Right? He stands on stage being amazing and getting everything right. So for me, it's, uh, I do lots of tricks like that. I do lots of routines where I'm just getting things right and looking clever. But then there comes a point where I want the audience to see how it's no longer just about being right. It's suddenly we can use this in ways that are useful to your life. So that's when the kind of the readings come in, when I start doing Q&A &Q and, I, and I give readings yeah. and I help people. So for me it's about the idea of connecting a room full of strangers so that they leave feeling like they were in a room full of friends. That's my goal. Yeah, that's a good point. very good point. Like through the connection in the feeling of mystery. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You started maybe with linking rings or a magic set of kids. 
and then at the age of 15 you publish something like yeah. Seven Deceptions. So, so the, Seven the, the story of, of that first book that I published called Seven Deceptions, I was 16 and um, so this is what happened. I've always looked older than I am. My whole life I've looked older than I am. I'm 33 now. I think I look like I'm probably 43. So I've always looked older. 24. Yeah. <laughs> I've always looked older. Uh, so when I was uh, young, I did traditional magic. I learned card tricks. But I was ferocious about it, like ferocious about it. Um, I never stopped and I learned as much as I could and I read so much and I watched so much and um, I really just soaked it all in because of the magic shop, right? It, it was like I had all of this information available to me, so I just kept soaking it in. And I'd always liked mentalism, especially because of sort of growing up around spooky stuff. I'd always quite liked mentalism, but I never thought I looked old enough to do it. You know, you couldn't be a, yeah. a 13 year old or a 10 year old doing mentalism. It would look ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, so I'd always wait. And then when I was around 13, I looked like I was probably 20, to be honest. Like I looked older, I had a beard and stuff at 13, so I looked older. And um, I was still doing normal magic, but I'd started doing the odd bit of mental magic and mentalism and kind of weird things in between the two. And I had another chance encounter with a very generous man. Uh, this man was called Panacos, and he uh, owned a restaurant in a place in London called Camden, which is a, a kind of cool, sort of, quirk. at that time it was very quirky and very cool. Now it's a bit kind of touristy, but it was very cool and quirky back then when I was young. Um, and he was a fan of magic. And he came into International Magic to buy some magic tricks and I demonstrated. He said, you know what, I want you to do magic in my restaurant. I said, okay, uh, I'd love to. I don't know, how, you know. He said, well, come, come next week. And he said, uh, I want you to do magic for six weeks. And then he said, how much will that cost? And I just sort of looked at him and just said, a hundred pounds. I had no idea, right? A hundred pounds is what I said. He said, no problem. So I came to the first week and I did it. And he gave me a hundred pounds. I was like, wow. And then it dawned on me that it was going to cost me 60 pounds to get there for six weeks. The, the train ticket, the underground, 10 pounds per week, 60 pounds. So it was 40 pounds for six weeks of work, right? One night a week. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what I said, so I have to do it. Um, and I went back the second week and I did it, and he gave me another hundred pounds. I said to him, you've already paid me the hundred pounds. He said, no, 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 this is the first lesson. Before you tell anyone how much it costs, you have to work out how much it costs. So like, you can't charge me £100 because it costs you, and he knew how much it would cost for me to get around. So he sat me down and was like, so the next time, you have to work out how much does the travel cost? If you're going by car, how much is the petrol? Did I, and he gave me like a little business lesson as a restaurant owner. And then, um, so then I did that once a week for six weeks. And then he would start calling me and say, uh, you know what, we want you to come in three times this week. You know, and now, now people are asking for you to come in because they say it's so great. Your fee's now £200 a night. It's now £350 a night, and he just kept giving me more for the fee. I never asked for it, he just kept saying, here's more and more. And at one, by, by, uh, there was a point in that time when I was like 13, 14, every single day of the week, five days a week, I was finishing school, getting on a train and going to the restaurant and working five nights a week until two o'clock in the morning. So my schoolwork was terrible, right? Like I just didn't <laughs> care about that. I never did it, I'd like just be asleep in the class. But I was doing these magic tricks every night for people. And <clears throat> so this was walk around magic, like in a restaurant. Yeah. But I would start just slowly doing like the odd piece of mentalism. So I would do normally that the, the set that I did then was uh, a haunted deck routine. Okay. Uh, Nicholas Einhorn's version of Spooked, which is excellent trick. Uh, and then I would do a a version of Ashes on Palm, yeah. but with somebody's lipstick. Uh, and then I started doing. Uh, just having somebody peek at a card and then reading their mind to tell them what the card was. And it got big reactions, like, oh, maybe I can start doing some of this mind reading stuff. So then very slowly it just became all mind reading stuff over the course of maybe six months. And, and I, during that time I was just testing different ideas that I had, because I used to do a coin to cross as well. And the last coin, I would always make the coin vanish here. And I would say, did you feel it arrive? And Every magician I had ever seen in my life at that point, if the person said yes, I felt it arrive, they would make some joke. They would say like, oh, you must be drunk, or you know, like some silly joke. 
they, the first time that happened but when I was doing that at the tables I sort of went in my mind I thought this is real magic Right, so I, I was like, good, you felt it, this means we're connected, and I just suddenly was like, okay, this is real magic now, right? So then suddenly I got into all of this kind of suggestion material, so how you can use suggestion in magic, and I was just doing it every night, every night, from five, five o'clock in the evening until two o'clock in the morning, every night, five nights a week. And, and during that time I had a few ideas for some like original tricks of mine, but they used a couple of um, ideas that I had learned on Kenton Nepper's Wonder Words series. Um, so I emailed Kenton Nepper and said, I have this trick and I'm, uh, I'd like to share it with some friends of mine in London, but I want your permission because he uses your ideas. And he said, absolutely, uh, to that trick. And then he said, do you have more? And I said, yeah, here's some other stuff. Doesn't, doesn't use any of his you know, methods, but just other ideas that I've got. And I sent them to him and he said, oh, I'd love to publish this as a book. So I just said, that's crazy, okay, and that's how it happened. So it was just pure luck again. So I was lucky that I met the McMillans. I was lucky that I met this man called Panacos that ran a fantastic restaurant. He was such a kind man, Panacos. Uh, at one point he, he, had, uh, he had bought a lottery ticket uh, for a joke. A lottery ticket, you know, like he had bought it as a joke. And as he walked out, there was a homeless man sitting outside the shop. And the homeless man said, don't worry, I'll be your good luck charm. And that night, he won a very small amount of money, maybe 10 euros, but like a very small amount of money on this lottery ticket. So Panacos went back to the shop and gave the 10 euros to the homeless man and said, you are my good luck charm, so you have to come with me to my restaurant now. And he took the homeless man to his restaurant and fed him dinner every night, got him like looked after and helped from the local people, got him a place to live. It, once a week, all of the families that lived in the kind of the, the poorer part of Camden would come into his restaurant and have dinner for free. He would like buy. There is one in a million like yes. this. It's, he was an incredible man, incredible man, and it was just like his whole life was seeing people that I think he wanted to give a better life to. So, so you know, Ron McMillan saw me as a little boy and was like, I want to help him, and then Panacos saw me as a as a teenager and was like, I want to help him. And then I connected with Kenton Nepper and he was like, I want to help you. So it's just these chance encounters of, of people, you know, that were just like the stars aligning, you know. Yeah. So it, it's always been a case of surprising connections appearing that have then allowed me to just sort of naturally move in the way I want to. Yeah. yeah. So over that six month period, I went from doing Augmented Deck and A Coins Across and and you know, I'm trying to think of the other magic tricks that I did then. A version of Flash Cash, Pat Page's version. Um, kind of close up magic magic. Yeah. And I Classical. just slowly, yeah, slowly, slowly that stuff fell away. And suddenly it was, I used to do PK touches and then I did a routine, like a billet routine around the table. And then I would do, uh, I did Banachek's PK time as well, where yeah. the hands moved. So, so a mixture of not like heavy mentalism, yes, but yes, mental well, magic. I, yeah, and then and then after that, um, a magician called Jerry Sadovitz in England, uh, who I knew some international magic, uh, said, "Well, I'm going to take a show to the Edinburgh Festival, uh, and I want you to do mentalism in the show. I want you to be a mentalist in the show." I was like, "Okay, I'd love to do that." So then I just again said yes and went and did a, sta a stage show, like a parlour show. Um, and that's when I started really deciding, okay, so it is mentalism. So I was about about 16 when all of that happened and then the book came out. Yeah. So so I performed it all and then been speaking to Kent Nepper and then I went and did this thing in Edinburgh and then that book came out and then it was like, okay, well, this is what I do now, you know, and, and I haven't ever done anything else. I can't you, do anything you else. You had a lot of good chances, but also you were also yes. brave to... to yeah, exactly. maybe. Maybe I, I, I think I was just very fortunate, and and that good fortune, like literally just the stars aligned, that allowed me to do the thing that I should do, yeah. you know, and and it would have been very easy for any one of those things to not have happened, and maybe I would have gone in a different direction out of necessity, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was just very good luck, really. And then after I'd done that Edinburgh Festival with with Jerry Sadovitz. He was in a different show, it was three of us. It was myself doing mentalism. 
uh, a female British comedian, comedy magician called Mandy Muden, that's a great friend and a very funny magician, and a very good Scottish car magician called Jackie McClements. Uh, and all three of us did like 20 minutes in the show. So I did 20 minutes of mind reading, Jackie McClements did 20 minutes of card magic, and Mandy Muden did 20 minutes of comedy magic. Um, but it was produced by Jay Sullivan, so it was a really good experience and it sort of allowed me to perform a bit. And then after that I came and did a few shows in London because I had 20 minutes, but I wanted an hour, right? So I wanted to have an hour's worth of material. So I did some shows in a basement venue, a terrible venue, and uh, Darren Brown and Andy Nyman and Andrew O'Connor and Anthony Owen and Barry and Stewart and Ali Cook and uh, Stephen Fry, the comedian, lots of lots of people just came to this show underneath a pub because they heard that you should see this. In fact, Andy Nyman chased people after the show in the street, normal people that had come to the show, and questioned them if they were a stooge or not. He, uh, he'd probably never admit that now, but I know that you did that, <laughs> Andy. Um, and then after Darren had seen that show, he called me a couple of days later and said, would you like to come and consult on the TV series? At that point he had had, a, I think he had had a special, one special, which I didn't have anything to do with. And then he saw that show and asked me to come and help him and Andy and others uh, write material for the next, what would be the TV series. So I did that for like two or three, I don't remember exactly how many now, but maybe two or three of Darren's TV yeah. shows. Um, so it's always just been like one thing's led to another. So, uh, a last question. What's uh, your creative process? Yeah, so um, the creative process, unfortunately, is the answer is not a good one. Uh, the answer is I don't have one. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's the truth is that I, uh, I have to now be more um, strict about the way that I approach creating material because we have deadlines where yeah. you know a show is going to start touring on this day there will be an audience in this place on this day at this time so you have to have a show right so so now I have to be more strict about the way that I write things and the way that I work on things and I've done a lot of work with other people where I've gone to help them with their shows and they've got deadlines so you can't just sit around waiting for inspiration like you have to work um, but I don't have like a, it's never the same twice. Yes, it's uh, never the same uh, twice. It's not agreed that you. Are. No, no. But okay. most often, the one thing that does seem to be constant for me is that I always start with the script, yeah. never with the trick, never ah, okay. with the method. Yeah. So I don't, I don't sit down and think like, oh, I want to do a drawing duplication. Ever. Yeah. I start thinking about what do I want to say and what words are interesting, what phrases. Is there some poetry that I think is nice? Is there is there a moment in a film that I think has a really good sort of tension? Or why does it have that tension? Is there a lyric in a song that makes me think of something? So it's always with the script. Okay. And then after I've written a script, normally and for, for about 40 minutes of material, so I write a script for like, that if you just stood there and read it, it would take 40 minutes. Um, I'll edit it down to like 15 minutes, because 30 minutes of the thought we would yeah. be terrible, but then I'll keep <laughs> around 15. And then I'll, I'll keep doing that until I've got like a kind of a story of a show. Okay. And one part will just kind of lead to the next part because you look at what's happening here and you think, oh, so now, now we've kind of started to establish this idea, now we need to develop it in this direction. And then when I've got like a basic idea of what story I want to tell, then I start thinking about the tricks. Because if the story you want to tell is about I don't know, let's just let's just make an imaginary mind reading show right now. Let's say that we are going to tell the story of um, how when we go to sleep, maybe the dreams that we have are not completely random. In fact, maybe those dreams are experiences that belong to other people. And somehow, if you could learn to understand the dreams that you have while you're asleep, you may be able to understand people that you meet on the street better. So when I close my eyes and I put myself into a sleep state, I see these images, but maybe they're not random, maybe they're the things that I need to tell you. It's just a good story, right? Like that's the kind of story that would make a film. Right? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, now, so now if that's the show that I'm writing, I'll start thinking, okay, so what tricks can I do with that premise? Obviously, yeah. if that's the premise, I can't do metal bending. Of course. 
because it doesn't fit, right? So, so that's why I never start with the tricks. Not out of yeah. out of like any great kind of artfulness, but in fact out of practicality. That if I write the story first, it now means that very often, instead of there being a million different tricks that you could do, suddenly there are only yes. six. Right? There's yeah. only six tricks that yeah, make sense. You're, you also have to have a, a huge knowledge of tricks and oh, to find, yeah, yeah, to yeah, find yeah, the compose, as you said on your lecture, yeah. no? Yeah, yeah, to compose it to tell the story. But my, yeah, that's my, you know, if there's any one sort of constant, that's, that's how I always start. And one little trick that I do, and I do this with my own shows, and I did it with Dynamo's show, and I just a show that I just did with Josh Jay, I did it as well. I write a story as if I'm someone that's going to the show. So I pretend that I'm ah, emailing okay. someone the next day yes. about what I experienced the night before. So I write a story of like, Completely you know... backward. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I say like, um, you know, I turned up, uh, you know, traffic was terrible, but I arrived just in time. I walked into the theatre. We, we had to have a mad rush to get to our seats. But when we sat down, there was crazy music and flashing lights or whatever... Yes, whatever I'm yes, doing, yes. and then I read it you back as if, it's, as if it's someone that's come to see the show telling someone else about the show, because very often that, that shows me like what bits are most exciting, like what bits would you tell someone about, what's interesting, what's boring, you know, so in this version that I've written yeah. here, I don't talk about anything in the first 15 minutes of the show, well maybe the first 15 minutes of the show are bad then, right, it just lets me see where things are, and sometimes it's a really good way of like um, freeing yourself from a burden, like a, a weight of having to work stuff out. Like, yeah. you know, if you sit at a blank piece of paper and you're like, You know, like it's very easy to start typing. Yeah. The performer shuffles a deck of cards. You know, like or, <laughs> you know, because you just have to type something. So to like trick yourself into seeing it from another perspective, sometimes gives you like breakthroughs that you never would have thought of had you not tried to see it from that new way. Yeah, that's great. So thank you, Luke. Uh, You're so welcome. It's, it's a pleasure. Talk, we so. hope to to see you soon. <laughs> thank you. And now I get to eat some pasta. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you.